Topic 2.8, Centripetal Acceleration. Our goal with this topic is to ultimately be able to explain phenomena such as the demonstration that I'm about to show. By understanding centripetal acceleration, we'll ultimately be able to understand why when I spin the plate around with a small cup of water in the center, the water stays inside the cup and the cup does not fall off the plate. Okay, come down a little bit. I want to like Let's see how that looks. So, if we remember correctly, the acceleration. is defined as the change in velocity over the change in time. And acceleration is caused by forces. But the thing that we need to remember about acceleration is that acceleration has two components. That change in velocity has two parts. There's first of all the magnitude. And we've already looked at the magnitude. And secondly, it has direction. So centripetal acceleration So acceleration is said to occur when either the magnitude of the velocity or its direction or both change. Now in the past we've only looked at the magnitude of the velocity. We didn't allow the direction of the velocity to change. And that's what we're going to look at a little bit differently now because now we'll keep the magnitude the same but we'll allow the direction to change and as a result of that we'll find that we get a new kind of acceleration called centripetal acceleration. So the definition of centripetal acceleration is the following. And you've felt this centripetal acceleration in many situations when you go in a roller coaster and we go through a loop, we feel the centripetal acceleration. When you go around a turn in a car and you feel that force that makes you want to, feels like you're being thrown to the side, that's also that centripetal acceleration. Now, to understand centripetal acceleration, we need to look closely at what is the direction of the velocity as our path changes. So we'll draw an example path. I'll 
put a nice curve to the path. So this is our path. And we can look at the velocity at several points. So let's pick a couple of points. Okay, at this instant in time, at point A, the direction of the velocity is always tangent to the path. That means to say that it's parallel to the path. So if I were to draw the velocity vector at this point, the velocity vector would look something like this. This would be the velocity at point A. <clears throat> at point B, the velocity has changed directions. Our path has curved. And the velocity vector at this point, I draw the same length arrow. No change in the magnitude but the direction has changed. And then finally down here at C, I get the velocity of C. So at each of the three points, I find that the magnitude of the velocity is always tangent to the path. So if I follow and I think of the direction of the velocity at any instant in time, then I find that that velocity always points along a direction that is tangent to the path unless the path is straight. Now when the path becomes straight, the velocity and the path match up and point in the same direction. So let's look at a second example. This time, let's not just make a curved path, let's actually make a circular path. And we'll pick two points again point A and point B. So again, at point A, we would find a velocity which points tangent to the path. So at this point, the velocity is pointing upward, but then later at point B, the velocity is pointing towards the left. And once again, the circle represents the path. So we should make a note here let's change this a little bit let's say the velocity vector we really want to emphasize the direction is always tangent to the path. So the velocity vector is always tangent to the path, but to understand the acceleration of this object, we need to understand the change in velocity. So we need to figure out what is the actual direction of the change in the velocity. So let's think about this for this example, example two. So the definition of delta V, of course, we all know would be the final initial, final velocity, sorry, let's say V2 minus the initial velocity at V1. So in the past, we did vector addition. So for example, V1, or let's say VA plus VB, this would have looked like this. We would have had a vector pointing up to represent VA, and then head to tail, we would have put vector B. Vector B would look like this. And the result of those two doing vector addition looks like this, and this is VA plus VB. But now, what we'd like to do is vector subtraction. In vector subtraction, what I would first do is draw the second vector. The second vector, if you remember, is going to be vector b. So I draw vector b,
Now, how do I subtract vector 1? Well, subtracting vector 1 would be the same thing as adding negative vector 1. So, rather than add vector a, which points up, I'll add the opposite of vector a, which is a vector that points downward. So, I'm adding the negative. This is how I do vector subtraction. So, that means that rather than adding a vector that points up, I would add a vector that points down. And this will accomplish the goal of vector subtraction. This is VA. And so now I can draw the result of these two, the vector subtraction. And this is VB minus VA, or we could refer to this as delta V. Now, notice the direction that, vel that delta V points. Delta V points down and to the left. Now, where did this change occur from vector from the change in V originating from the, from the velocity A? It occurred during this portion of the path right here. If we were to take this vector and were to place it in that point, you would find that it points towards the center of the circle. Or that is to say, points along the radius. So delta V points in towards the center of the circle. Very important piece of information. Now, the change in time is not going to affect the direction, so the direction of centripetal acceleration, the direction of this acceleration is based on the direction of the change in V, and in this case, we found that the change in V always points towards the center of the circle. So knowing that the centripetal acceleration always points in towards the center of the circle. Over here, the centripetal acceleration points in this way. Over here at B, it points down. Here at C, the centripetal acceleration actually points upward. Here at B, it points into the center. At A, it points into the center. This should sort of make sense because, of course, if my velocity was pointing this direction and the car turned in this direction towards the left, that could only happen because there was a force pointing to the left. So it should make sense that this change in velocity, this acceleration that the car feels, actually points in towards the center because, of course, that's what's responsible for making the car turn in that direction. And we'll talk a little bit more about the concept that there feels as though there's an outward force when you go around a turn. Now, unfortunately, this only gives us the direction of the acceleration. It doesn't give us the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration. For that, we need to use the small angle approximation, and because this involves a substantial amount of math that I don't feel is really extremely relevant to understanding centripetal acceleration, I've chosen to do the small angle approximation and, and walk you through the math that actually allows us to derive the centripetal acceleration formula in a separate video called Topic 2.8 Supplemental. Instead of deriving it for you right here, we're going to go straight to the answer. 